Welcome everyone uh, to the first uh, seminar in the D Development Studies Seminar Series. Um, we're very pleased to have Maya Goodfellow uh, joining us. She's going to be talking about debunking the myths about immigration. Um, and Maya, this follows on from her book that just come out with Verso uh, called The Hostile Environment. Um, and she's a, she's a writer, an academic, a broadcast commentator. She's written for the New York Times, uh, The Guardian, The New Statesman, um, and on a range of issues, including uh, UK politics, gender, race, and uh, immigration. She has a PhD um, in the department, um, and she's, as I say, uh, author of Hostile Environment, How Immigrants Became Scapegoats, and that's out with Verso. It's just come out, actually. Um, so she's going to speak for about uh, 45 minutes, uh, and then we'll hear from Paru um, with, uh, with a few uh, comments, and then there might be a little bit of a Q&A, and then we'll open it out uh, to the floor. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Faisy, for that. Thank you also to everyone who is involved in putting on um, this series of events. I know they're really well attended, and I'm really pleased to be able to take part in um, one of them. Thank you, everyone, to, for coming as well on what is a pretty grim uh, Tuesday evening. Um, so what I'm going to do is... Uh, so the book that Faisy mentioned, it kind of charts the history of um, immigration policy and rhetoric in the UK specifically, and looks at some of the main arguments that are made against immigration. And instead of going through that history, what I'm going to do is maybe spend the next half an hour to 40 minutes uh, talking about how the debate has historically manifested, and this kind of maps on to a lot of the contemporary discourses we see today. I'll mention, try and mention some of those as well. Um, so I want to challenge, essentially, the two... Um, main arguments that are made against immigration, one which is, falls into the camp of economics and the other which falls into the ca camp of culture. But before I want to do that, I want to speak about a particular case, um, which I think illuminates some of the things that I'm going to talk about. Uh, and this is the case of Joy Gardner. So I just want to get a, this is not a test. I'm not trying to shame anyone. I just want to get a sense. I've done this a few times and it's always interesting to get a sense in the room of how many of you know who Joy Gardner is or the case of Joy Gardner? If you could raise your hand. Okay, so there's maybe a few people. Um, okay. Uh, um, yeah, I'm gonna say, not going to say comment on that. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a bit about um, Joy Gardner's case. For those of you who know, this will be a recap. And for those of you who don't, this will be an introduction into what happened to Joy Gardner. Um, and I'll try to explain why I'm doing this as I go. So Joy Gardner was born in Jamaica and she grew up in Long Bay, Portland. She came to the UK in 1987 when she was 34 years old and she came to join her mother who had come to the UK from Jamaica um, just over 20 years earlier in 1961. So her mum came to the UK when this country was, when Jamaica was still a colony of this country and Jamaica would um, get independence a year later. So... As some of you may or may not know, maybe you've picked some of this up from the coverage of the so-called Windrush scandal um, over the past few years. Because of the way the UK nationality law worked at the time, Joy Gardner's mother could come to the UK um, because she lived in a British colony. So she, like anyone else who was living in a colony or former colony, could come to the UK as a British citizen. This had long been the case, but was... Um, essentially put into law through the 1948 um, Nationality Act. So anyone who lived in a colony or what had become a former co colony could come to the UK legally as a British citizen. But by the time Joy came to join her mother over 20 years later, that British immigration and nationality law had drastically changed. So successive pieces of legislation had been introduced to essentially make it more difficult for people to migrate to the UK. So for people who weren't at the time immigrants, people who were citizens of, of as I've said, this, a lot of these le pieces of legislation essentially turned these people into immigrants. There's something that Gaminda Bamba calls policies of racialization as opposed to immigration legislation. But a lot of that legislation, I think is important to know, was introduced by both conservative and labor governments. So the Labour Party often talks about its proud anti-racist history, and whilst it's true that there has been a lot of anti-racist organising within um, the body of the Labour Party, it has also been complicit in, in implementing some of the most racist pieces of legislation that has ever been seen in, um, in passed through the House of Commons. And the reason I'm saying that is a lot of that legislation around immigration and nationality was implicitly colour-coded. 
So it wasn't stated in the pieces of legislation themselves, but what a lot of the immigration acts that were introduced from the 1960s onwards were intended to do was to make it more difficult for people of colour from colonies and former colonies to come to the UK. And this is now widely agreed in much of the academic literature, but there are also politicians from the time who have talked about this and who have noted that if people living in those colonies and former colonies had been white, there would not have been this effort to try and limit immigration in this particular way. And the reason why I think this is important is not only because it impacted Joy Gardner, but because I think in maybe less so it applies less so to people in this room, but at least in our popular discourse, people are quite well versed with the history of Enoch Powell, the Rivers of Blood speech, the National Front. But what a lot of people are far less well versed in is the fact that a lot of the ideas that Enoch Powell espoused, a lot of the logics at the heart of some of the speeches made by Enoch Powell, were essentially mainstream. They were part of the mainstream, and they exist in a lot of this legislation that was passed through Parliament. And so when politicians aren't denigrating immigration, they're often, um, they're often celebrating it, right? So we hear mainstream politicians talking about immigration as having had a positive impact on the UK if they're going to talk about it positively at all. But they are far less inclined to engage with these very, very insidious and very damaging forms of exclusion that often met people when they arrived or meant that people couldn't come here to begin with. And this telling where racism is knitted into immigration legislation by the party political left and right, I think would undermine this notion that is often quite uncritically espoused that the UK is a progressive and welcoming country. We only need to look at the case of Meghan Markle, which I think we will maybe talk about in the Q&A, um, to see actually how false that vision of the UK is now. But it's long been a false vision of the UK. And so thinking about this legislation, a particular piece of legislation that was introduced was the British Na Nationality Act of 1981. And so until this act was introduced, Joy Gardner would have had the right to British citizenship through her mother. So it's quite complicated how this worked, but essentially this act, which was implemented by a Conservative government, so it was Margaret Thatcher's government, but the ground for which was actually laid by the Labour government that had come just before it, meant that she couldn't get citizenship. So Joy Gardner came into this country as a tourist, and she was only able to stay here for six months under the way, the way that um, nationality and immigration legislation worked at the time. So though her mother had been able to come, she was not able to come and settle in the UK. So she did come for six months. She came on this tourist visa. But after those six months, she decided to stay in the country. And, you know, there's a lot of... I would encourage you all to go and read about this particular case because I can't really do it justice in the amount of time I have. There was a lot of back and forth um, between the state and immigration officials. Um, so Joy was attempting to stay in the UK. The, the government was trying to deport her. She was very briefly married. Um, and there were a number of deportation attempts, a number of appeals, and she was essentially trying to find a way to stay in the UK. So to stay in a country where her mother and much of her extended family lived, but also a country where during this time she'd had a son. So this, this, is, this is really where we get to what happened to Joy. So she'd come to the UK, was attempting to stay here, but the government was trying to deport her. And... What happened to Joy, this is according to her lawyer and reports from the time, is that um, on the 28th of July, a, a group of police officers came to her flat to deport her. And the Home Office had deliberately not told her that this was going to happen because they claimed that they thought she would abscond. So at this time, she believed that her attempt to stay in the country was still being considered. And what essentially happened is her solicitors received notification later that same day, so the same day, the 28th of July, that um, her um, attempt to stay in the UK had been rejected by the Home Office. But the letters that they received um, informed them of this de impending deportation were dated the 26th and 27th of July, 1993. So that was two days before this deportation attempt happened and before essentially what was an immigration raid. And the immigration minister at the time admitted that those letters were intentionally sent um, at a later date so that Joy would not be forewarned about this planned deportation and so her solicitors couldn't advise her about what was going to happen. So on this summer morning, a few months after Stephen Lawrence had been killed, 
these immigration officials and police turned up at her home where she was with her five-year-old son. And I'm not going to go into all the, in, uh, the exactly what happened. Um, it's, it's quite graphic what they did to her, but essentially they, um, they tried to restrain her. They, they claimed that there was, there was this kind of violent struggle, but it's contested exactly what happened at the time. And because of the way that they restrained her in an incredibly brutal and violent way, um, the oxygen to her brain was um, cut off. She suffered brain damage and she eventually died a few days later after this encounter with these immigration officials. Three police officers were tried on manslaughter charges in 1995 and they were all acquitted and there has never been an inquiry into her death. And so in an interview for um, a collection of essays, which I would recommend you having a look at, which is called Mother Country, The Real Stories of the Windrush Children, which is edited by Charlie Brinkhurst Cuff, her mother urges us to not only remember this story, but also to remember Joy as she was, as someone who, she says, as a student, as a mother, and as someone who was studying media, media because she wanted to be a journalist. This was all before her dreams were cut short. And as well as the fact that I think actually this case isn't particularly well known in the UK, which I think tells us a lot about who and what is remembered in, in what ways in terms of our national consciousness, it's also an instructive case in a lot of ways because the way that she was treated and her experiences of the immigration system, um, I think really show us the human outcome of successive pieces of leg immigration legislation. So those pieces of immigration legislation that I mentioned that were devised to make it more difficult for people of color to come to this country, but also the damaging impact that dehumanizing language and policy has on people. So how, how is this even possible? How is it even possible to get to this, this stage where this happened? Um, and I think it demonstrates one of the problems with this term illegal immigration. So if you recall when this, the so-called Windrush scandal was um, on the front pages of our newspapers, was being, immigration was being talked about perhaps for the first time in British history, not because immigrants were being denigrated, but because British policy was being held up as um, to, to show what the human effects of it were. The government, and actually um, the government talked about the hostile environment as necessary to deal with undocumented people. Um, and even in the wake of the Windrush scandal, there was kind of agreement across the political spectrum. So even parts of the left of the Labour Party were still talking about illegal immigrants. They were kind of uncritically repeating this term. And I think not only is this term incredibly dehumanizing, what Joy Gardner's life and what her death shows us is that people who are undocumented are people. So their cases, their lives, and the ins and outs of why they have become undocumented is far more complex than this label illegal will ever allow. And what I found doing the research for the book was so many people who'd become undocumented because law had changed around them or they weren't able to pay the huge amounts it costs to have your um, your visa or your application processed they were worried because they live in a country that proudly calls its immigration policies or at least did the hostile environment and so there are so many reasons you can become undocumented or you may come into the country as someone who's undocumented um and that isn't really considered much at all in our political discourse but i think what the case of Joy Gardner also shows is that although we might want to believe that it did, the hostile environment for immigrants in the UK did not begin with Theresa May and the coalition government. And it didn't begin with Brexit either. To, to recognize that, I think, does not, it doesn't mean ignoring the very specific forms of suffering and damage that have been caused by the hostile environment, that are still being caused by the hostile environment, because although the so-called Windrush scandal happened the hostile environment is still in place and no minister, no member of government has ever actually been held accountable. Amber Rudd, who was forced to resign as Home Secretary, only did so because it was um, she misled Parliament about deportation targets. But to recognise that, it doesn't mean ignoring the specificity of current forms of marginalisation, discrimination and racism. But I think it's really difficult to argue that hostility in our immigration system only comes in the form of go-home bans or the hostile environment if you look at this broader history. And this is part of the reason why I decided to write the book. I'm not going to recount for you all the history of the UK's immigration legislation or the rhetoric um, or the outcome of a lot of this, poli this very politics because I've kind of documented that in the book and it would take me quite a long time to do that. But I do want to think about the fact that this has been made possible by these two myths that I kind of I mentioned at the start. 
Um, so the myths about immigration that make it possible for government to legislate in this way, that mean the rhetoric is so poisonous, and that mean that people are impacted in the way that Joy Gardner was by decisions made by politicians, but then also um, immigration enforcement carried out by immigration officials and the police. And these anti-immigration arguments that make this punitive policy, these punitive policies possible, I think they come in two kind of overlapping forms. So I'm going to talk about... Um, both of these different forms that they manifest. So the first is economics and the second is culture. And I think everyone's probably quite well versed in the economics argument. So this notion that immigration is bad for the British economy. And a really good example of this was in September 2017, which now seems like quite a long time ago, when Theresa May told the Commons that there is a reason for wanting to control migration is because of the impact that net migration can have on people, on access to services and on infrastructure. But crucially, it's also because it often hits those at the lower end of the income scale the hardest. Now, putting aside the fact that politicians like Theresa May seem to only care for the welfare of the people at the lower end of the income scale when it's immigration that is the subject of um, discussion, these arguments about, about the economy come in kind of two contradictory forms, at least. So it's this idea that immigrants are paradoxically taking jobs whilst at the same time coming to scrounge off the state. I can't be doing both of those things at the same time. So people coming to take nursing and doctor's posts whilst also draining public services. And this was very, very clearly articulated in the general election that we've just had. So the Conservatives talked a lot about the so-called Australian-style points-based system, which, by the way they're not going to implement. That was never what their plans looked like, but it was quite readily accepted in a lot of sections of the media, so much so that right after the election, I was talking to a producer about, um, she asked me what I thought were the things to watch out for, for that the Conservative government were going to do with this massive majority. And I said, well, you know, they've said that they're going to implement this Australian-style points-based system. But if you look at the details, the very scant details of what they released in terms of what they will implement, that's not that's not what they're going to implement at all. And she paused and she said, no, that is, they've said they're going to implement an Australian-style points-based system. So that, that is the plan. And I thought, for something talked about so much, immigration has been the subject of so much political discussion, and the Conservatives have essentially managed to get through a general election campaign without having their plans scrutinised really much at all. And the reason that this matters is because what they did is they used this as a signifier. They used the Australian-style points-based system as a signifier for something that um, means control, but also for something that means for a lot of people whiteness. People understanding Australia as a country that is white, even though we know that the reality of that is very different. And what the Conservatives actually want to do, which they've talked about, is do things like slightly relax visa rules, slightly reduce costs for people who work in um, the health service, but they want to make it more difficult for other people to come into the country. So what they were saying is, we want doctors and nurses to come and work in our hospitals, but we also don't want too many immigrants because they will disrupt the NHS and drain, be a drain on our public services. So there was a contradiction right at the heart of what they were saying. And this is the thing about this argument, is that we know it is patently untrue. We know that immigration doesn't drive down wages, and we know that it isn't the cause of low pay. And... I often think a good way to try and combat this is asking people why they think that it was people who've just moved into the UK, how they would have created the conditions where people are being exploited. How does that happen? It doesn't really add up. And we know that the reality, I mean, I'm probably telling uh, people in this room probably already know this, but it is often people who've migrated to the UK who are involved in, not always, but are at times involved in fighting for better paying conditions across the country. So whether it be an institution like SOAS or whether it be places like Sotheby's or the LSE, what you see is you find the people, people struggling against these poor conditions, low pay and bad conditions, are, are migrants. But this, this is far less likely, when those struggles are covered in the press, that it, the immigration status of these people is far less likely to be discussed about than when it is people analysing low pay in Britain. And so you kind of have this, you have this real difference in how these two things are covered. Immigration is relevant in one and not relevant in the other. But I think there is actually a... One of the things that I argue in the book is that there is a problem with just framing people as economic contributors. It's something that the Labour Party at the last election did... To, to an extent, they talked about people who contribute to the economy, people, the jobs that people do. And I think we do need to reject this argument that immigration is bad for pay or that it reduces the number of jobs available for people in the UK. But you, 
I don't think you can argue against anti-immigration narratives by saying we're going to have an immigration system that's good for the economy. Because in doing so, you prop up this idea that some people are good and productive and some people are not. And a lot of people on the left don't want to talk about British people just as economic contributors in this quite dehumanizing way. So it, it's kind of puzzling as to why you would want to talk about immigration in this way. And I think it's far more productive to be thinking about this as structural. So thinking about the fact that we currently live in a world where capital can move with relative ease, but the movement of people, or the movement at least of some people, is considered a problem. So this is kind of where the Conservatives' plans come in, and we can understand what is going to be implemented, what is already exists for a lot of non-EU migrants, is unless movement is sanctioned and controlled by government, movement is considered incredibly dangerous if it's in the hands of the poor or people who are racialized as a threat. And what that movement often means, if, it's, if it is sanctioned, if it is allowed, is movement on very bad terms. So I think what we can anticipate um, in, over the next few years is the Conservatives essentially bringing EU migrants into a system that is already in, incredibly unfair for non-EU migrants. So for particular people, depending on your, the type of your visa, it means very poor terms, it means you only have the right to stay in the country for a particular amount of time and you're subject to these huge costs that I mentioned before. And what that's historically meant, and this happened in particular in the new Labour years, is people coming into the country spending a huge amount of money to get here so that they can for many different reasons, but in part at times to provide for people back home, send money back home. And what happens is the way that their visa terms work at times is they are only allowed to stay for such a specific amount of time and they barely recoup the costs they've spent moving by the time their visa is up. And so this is part of the problem, right, is the cost of it, but then also the terms of, of, those, um, of those visas. And something interesting that someone said to me when I, doing the research for the, uh, for the book, um, Asad Raymond from War and Want pointed out that as well as advocating for a world you know, in which movement is easier for everyone, we should also be talking about a world in which people should have the right to stay if they want to, right? So whether it's the country, city or town that they were born in, I think it's, we can probably agree that having to move because of economic degradation um, isn't necessarily something to celebrate. So at the same time, is trying to change the world so people can stay where they want to, you have to challenge this idea that movement is a threat to us, whoever that us is, and showing that it's actually borders that are the problem and not people. And a very good example of this is when 39 people were found dead in the back of a lorry in Essex, people who'd come into the country trying to make it to the UK because it was very difficult for them to do so. Um, the response from polit certain politicians and um, certain public figures was if there were more border checks, this wouldn't have happened. If you had stronger borders and more checks, this wouldn't have happened. And whilst it's true, if you had more checks, maybe those people would have been found in the, this lorry before they had suffocated, what it ignores is the, is the very checks and border controls that force people to climb into the backs of those lorries in the first place. So when politicians talk about smugglers being the problem, what is ignored is the fact that they are creating the very conditions in which this, these kind of smuggling markets can thrive. Right? They provide the business. Right? If you want to change that, you need to understand where, that, where, the, um, where the need is coming from, where the demand for smugglers is coming from in the first place. But I think this leads us to the next broad argument against um, immigration, the one that's been made for a very, very long time alongside the economic argument. Um, and so I've said this idea of people, the movement of some people is considered a threat and that that isn't only about economics, it is about race is, as I mentioned, a lot of the legislation has historically been incredibly racist. Um, but this has shifted how it functions in the debate more, more recently, at least in the past 30, 40 years or so. And how it's often articulated is the idea that immigration is a threat to British culture and to British people's way of life. So this thinking comes from a belief the anti-immigration feeling, so when people in Britain say they dislike immigration, that dislike has come from a natural reaction to too many immigrants of a certain kind coming into the country, right? So people dislike immigration because there are too many immigrants here, basically. That's, that's the argument that is, is, made, is made by um, people that I would call anti-immigration professionals, that I won't, I won't name them. Um, so a really good example of this is when David Cameron and his team were trying to negotiate with Brussels before the EU referendum. They said they couldn't find any... Um, evidence that would satisfy the European Commission that immigration put pressure on communities. Right? So they said, we couldn't find any evidence at all. And then this is a quote from someone um, 
who worked with David Cameron, who said, there was no hard evidence. That is not to say that we didn't perceive immigration as a problem. Cameron was convinced it was a real challenge, if perhaps more of a cultural one than an economic one. And so there is this acceptance right at the heart of government that it's not, immigration is not bad for the economy. They cannot prove that. They cannot prove that as part of these EU negotiations. They think it is a cultural problem. And you hear that culture argument in a lot of different ways. It's talked about in a lot of different ways. So people talk about the pace of change being too fast. And people talk about that they feel like their sense of British culture is under threat. People talk about walking down their local high street and not recognizing where they are and feeling like they're in a different country and they're no longer in Britain. Um, but all of this is produced by notions of racial and cultural difference. And the, the adage that's been used a lot by politicians in the past 15, 20 years is that it's not racist to be concerned about immigration. But what that does is it eclipses, it obscures how race can be at the heart of the debate. And so much of our debate is so focused on saying it's not racist to be concerned about immigration that it becomes very difficult to take a moment to analyse how race is operating in the debate and where. And one of the things that I found doing some of the research for the book is I watched quite a lot of documentaries about, um, about immigration in Britain, trying to see how it was covered in the media. It's a really hard thing to do to try and track how broadcast media covers issues like immigration. So there's only a partial picture. But what I found in three different documentaries across three different channels was that um, when, when the journalists who were doing these documentaries, they chose particular areas to go to. They chose particular areas of the country to go and look at. And they decided to look at those particular areas. The, the way they, they made that decision is that they looked at an area and looked at how many white people had lived in that area 20 years ago and how many white people live in that area now, right? So whiteness was used as a marker of change. And what they were saying is the proportion of white people living in X town was 95% in um, of the 1980s and now it is only 70%. And so what that tells us, and they're not aware they're doing this, I don't think, is they sh it shows one of the ways in which the immigration debate is very much still about racism because... Not all groups of immigrants, um, you know, are, some immigrants are white, and not all people of colour in Britain are immigrants. So there is a problem there right at the heart of this. Um, but it's interesting because not all groups, this leads us to understand how not all groups of immigrants are seen as culturally incompatible with the UK. So this, it's kind of, it's certain groups that are marked out as a threat, and the... Um, what would you call him? He's often called a public intellectual, but the, I think he's a journalist. I'm not sure I'd go so far as to call him a public intellectual. Um, David Goodhart talks about this in one of his books. And he says, um, he says this isn't to do with race. It's to do with culture. It's nothing to do with race. But consistently rejects that it's anything to do with race. But drawing on the academic Robert Putnam, he also makes the argument that 100,000 Australians coming into the Britain is very different from 100,000 Afghans. And so race is there but it just isn't being so explicitly talked about in the way that maybe it once previously was, you find this shift happen in the 70s and 80s with a group called the New Right, that Enoch Powell was like loosely part of. And what they say is they say, we do not think we are racially superior to, um, to, to people who are not white. We just think we are culturally different. British people are culturally different from groups of brown and black people who come to the UK, many of whom who had come to the UK, as I mentioned before, as sit British citizens. And what they argue, and what they argue now, people like um, David Goodhart argue, is that the reason why this is a problem, the reason why people feel it's, it's a problem that people, people feel anxious about their culture and their sense of self being under threat isn't only because that's a problem in and of itself, but because what it does is it weakens the bonds of solidarity between people, uh, between people in um, Britain and undermines support for institutions like the NHS. So unless everyone feels like they have a common culture and a common sense of identity, they are less likely to want to contribute to an institution like the NHS. So they kind of couch it in these terms that seem like vaguely progressive, if you like squint enough, but it is obviously so clearly still tied to these racialized ideas of culture. And the one question that I think should be asked to anyone who is making this argument, because I've going through a lot of this footage and a lot of these interviews, you know, I've seen Labour, Conservative, Liberal Democrat politicians talking about culture in this way is synonymous with race. 
I think they should be asked, what do they mean by British culture? How are they defining this sense of culture? And what does it mean to talk about a British culture? And I really enjoy quoting Stuart Hall on this because I think it forces people to think about exactly what it is they're talking about. And I'm just going to read a quote from Stuart Hall that quite a lot of you probably are familiar with, um, which is about tea. And he says, people like me who came to England in the 1950s have been here for centuries. Symbolically, we have been there for centuries. I was coming home. I am the sugar at the bottom of the English teacup. I am the sweet tooth, the sugar plantations that rotted generations of English children's teeth. There are thousands of others beside me that are the cup of tea itself because they don't grow it in Lancashire. Not a single t tea plantation exists within the United Kingdom. This is the symbolization of English identity. What does anyone in the world know about an English person except that they can't get through the day without a cup of tea? Where does it come from? Ceylon, Sri Lanka, India. That is the outside history that is inside the history of the English. There is no English history without that other history. So there's a very clear, there's a very clear problem at the heart of the, how people are conceptualizing Britain and how people are imagining immigrants and people who are considered to be not British is coming into the country and disrupting that sense of self. It's very hard to see how Britain isn't, Britain and British culture isn't tied up with these global connections that it's long had. But the other problem, and this is, I guess, to some extent, this is the bigger problem that I have with this argument. And the more insidious argument, uh, it's very much been mainstreamed in a lot of media and political debates, is that this, as I mentioned before, this cultural anxiety is treated as if it is natural and inevitable. So it's like there's no, no way around it. This is what a lot of politicians argue, is that there is no way around um, anti-immigration sentiment apart from curbing immigration because people are always going to feel this kind of discomfort about too many people coming into the country. And historically what this has meant is that politicians have argued that immigration control is necessary for good race relations. So you find this very much in the debates of the 60s and 70s, and essentially what politicians are saying is to reduce racism, you have to reduce immigration because racism is a product of too much immigration. And it's something that the Labour MP Stephen Kinnock argued, not in those exact words, right after the EU referendum, saying that it's the, the prejudice that you find right after the Brexit vote, so the spike in hate crimes and the racism that we saw across the UK is related to this natural reaction to too much immigration. And what this ignores is what we all know, that racism and anti-immigration views are produced. They're produced when immigration is problematized and certain groups of immigrants are demonized and where race and racial differences are treated as if they are real instead of constructed. And the a core way that this has kind of taken root in a lot of the political debate and actually analysis of um, the new Labour years is there's, very, there's, there's bits and pieces of academic work on new Labour, but there's only really one uh, comprehensive book length study of new Labour and immigration that doesn't really engage with this subject of race. Um, and that is because the myth is that in the new Labour years, immigration became a, such a hot political topic. So what you find is you do find a rise in anti-immigration sentiment and a rise in support for um, parties that profess to be anti-immigrant. Anti this happened, people say, and I was told this today um, as part of a, a debate, that this happened because New Labour let too many people in. So they let too many people come into the country from Eastern Europe in particular, and it's true that they miscalculated how many people were going to come into the country, but what it ignores, this let too many people in narrative, is it ignores the anti-immigration rhetoric and policy that was produced during that time by the new Labour government itself. It's quite complicated, I cover it in the book. So it's not, there is not one cohesive way that they talk about immigration and asylum, but almost from the get-go, from almost from day one, the new Labour government were talking about asylum in this incredibly problematic way. They were demonizing people who were trying to seek asylum. They were making asylum law stricter. And they were essentially reproducing the narratives that the far right thrive off of at the same time as they were saying something slightly different about immigration, because they were. But what is ignored, actually, is that that anti-asylum rhetoric, for a lot of people, they don't separate out in these distinct ways, asylum, asylum seekers, refugees, and immigrants. They do at particular times but not in a way that allows people to separate out 
oh, they're just talking about asylum seekers because we think immigration's okay. For, in, the, in the mind of a lot of people, it's the other is being produced there. And so they were feeding that narrative. And that, curiously, that is, is just so rarely talked about in the analysis of the new Labour years, at least in popular debate, but actually in some of this academic debate as well of understanding what happened during, um, during Blair and then Brown. And so what we can see from this is that it is actually anti-immigration politics and not immigration, not immigration itself that is the thing that is disrupting um, how people understand the country, it is dangerous, it is the damaging force, I think, in the UK. It is the thing that produces um, this dislike of immigration, not immigration itself. Um, but these ideas really persist. And maybe we're going to talk about this a tiny bit in the Q&A, thinking about how it's um, manifesting right now, including... Um, in parts of the left. It, these ideas are so widely accepted and the economic ones are, are I think, at times fought against um, more consistently by certain sections of society, but the, the so-called culture argument is almost not engaged with at all. Um, it's, it's, it's very accepted um, by a lot of political actors, I think, or avoided. I think it's one or the other. Um, if, I know, if I'm being unfair, then please do tell me, because I am kind of intrigued as to how people are trying to combat this. And I think at least at the level of um, national politics, that isn't happening in any major way. Um, so I'm just going to end, actually, to, by just reading just a few paragraphs from the end of the book that I think sum up, uh, sum up some of the things that I've tried to argue, um, but that also I think just some of the things that we should be reflecting on when we're thinking about who is affected and in what way. It was ordinary people who suffered in the early hours of the 14th of June 2017 in Kensington and Chelsea, one of the richest boroughs in the country. The blaze that tore through the 24-storey West London block snatched away people's homes, their neighbours, their friends and for some, their family members. 72 people died that summer morning. In the days following the fire that would simply become known as Grenfell, the name of the tower that had been reduced to a black, hollowed-out structure, residents would speak with fury and inconsolable grief about the fact that they had tried repeatedly to prevent something like this from happening. Complaints and concerns sent to the organisation responsible for running the block and thousands of others were ignored. In a prescient blog, tenants warned that they would only be heard when an incident in which, um, happened in which people died. The charred remains of Grenfell Tower stand on the city skyline as a reminder of failed housing policy driven by profit, austerity and corporate greed. In the days following this atrocity, who this impacted and exactly whose voices had been ignored became clear. The faces of the dead and the missing were taped to lampposts all over West London and appeared on front pages of national newspapers. People like Ligaya Moore and Khadija Say and her mother Mary Mendy. Many of them belong to the groups which society likes to malign as a burden, while ignoring the ways that they're grossly mistreated. Grenfell Tower was the home of migrants from all over the world, refugees and working class Britons of all races. Grenfell residents included the politicians, the people our politicians and media pit against one another when they blame migrants for undercutting wages, putting strain on our public services, taking up scarce housing or destroying culture. But they were all overlooked, all ignored. Ordinary people are concerned about immigration, we're told. But it was ordinary people who died at Grenfell. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maya. Um, okay, so we'll now hear from uh, Paru Rahman. Um, Paru has taught in the anthropology department for about 20 years. Uh, she's no longer teaching, but um, she writes on immigration and she's been hugely inspirational for students all at home throughout her time um, at SOAS. So, Paru. Thank you, Faisy. Um, I, think, I can think of a few other things to call David Goodhart, but maybe we shouldn't go there at the moment. <laughs> Um, I want to start off just by congratulating Maya. I was for a very brief period her second supervisor, so um, I think it's fantastic that not only has she uh, got through her PhD, but she's now produced this book which is really timely and important, and to me I think the most uh, 
resonant message in it is how many decades this has all been in the making. You know, we see each crisis, each racial, racial, racial crisis of racialization unfolding and is presented to us as if it's some new scenario. And it never ceases to amaze me how the British public have this capacity to be not only continually surprised, but have such little understanding of the history of the country that they live in. And I think it really has very dangerous consequences for us all. I mean, thinking about what you uh, related just there, it strikes me how early this started. Uh, there's a very um, sort of well-known, and those of us who are older in the audience will know, remember the Pathé newsreels? And we used to go to the cinema and there'd be a little short news clip that would come on uh, before the main film started. And it was a jolly British voice telling you something topical. And there was one that came out in 1958 called Our Jamaican Problem. And it was about um, immigration from Jamaica. And basically what it was saying, it was set in Brixton, but talking about why migrants came. It looked at how impoverished Jamaica was, although it didn't go into the reasons about why it was impoverished. Um, it talked about people coming here and the jobs they did, but then immediately went on to the mayor of Lambeth at that time, who then went on to say what a pressure it was putting on the schools in the area, how housing couldn't cope with these new uh, migrants from Jamaica. Um, and actually someone who was in the British Air Force, um, a Jamaican man, coming and trying to act the role of the good model migrant, yeah? saying, we're coming here, we're not coming here to take your jobs, uh, we come here to contribute to the country, etc. Et so all those tropes have been really present since very early on after the 1948 uh, mm. British Commonwealth Act, and also of course, they all relate back, as you referred to, with the Stuart Hall quote in particular, about this whole the whole colonial history of this country. But um, I, I have, maybe if we sort of gently ease into the q and I, I have a sort of continual uh, question in my head, because if you look at this country, it always has had an image of itself as being a sort of fair, liberal, tolerant country, you know, and you can, as I said before, shock after shock. So after the 1958 Notting Hill riots, mm. okay, the complete shock at what happened in the midst, when Kelso Cochran was murdered, okay, complete shock then at what had happened. Cherry Gross, Joy Gardner, as you mentioned, you know, case after case where the British public is constantly sort of surprised and we have this discussion about whether this is a racist country or not, yeah. But still we live in the midst of a situation, has, as Maya has demonstrated so deftly, about where the doors have been continually closed since 19, the 1950s, where immigration policy has rendered more and more people illegal, where borders are harder and harder to cross, where the consequences of that, we live on an island which is surrounded by death, you know, we're surprised when where people are discovered in the back of the lorry, but you have to say, especially if you internationalize this, this is something which is now common in the world that we live in and we choose to turn a blind eye to us. It's common because we have chosen to support governments that increasingly uh, put into place more and more restrictive border controls uh, in a world which actually needs and should allow more and more migration. Yeah, and the two don't go hand in hand at all. So that's one thing. Border controls are tightening all the time. The detention regime in this country is absolutely appalling. If you look at it in connection with other countries across Europe, uh, the record of this country about how many people we lock up who have done absolutely nothing wrong and how long they are kept in detention is completely shocking. Okay, so we have that. If you look at the children who try to come here for family reunions, who are seeking mm -hmm. asylum, the way they are treated is absolutely appalling. If you look at the history of racist murders in this country, police deaths at the hands of the police and the way they are responded to, it's not a good picture. Yeah? And yet, and everything that Myra's outlined as well, and yet, and yet, and this is maybe a trivial example, we have the situation at the moment where we're having a discussion of Harry and Meghan, yeah? and there's a continual discussion about whether this is a racist country. And I have to say that over the last three or four days, I've seen more elderly white men appear on TV <laughs> saying repeatedly, I don't believe this country is racist. And you have to really wonder how those two pictures live side by side, yeah? Mm. Uh, with the reality of what's been happening decade upon decade, and as Maya quite rightly says, with Tory and Labour governments uh, to the point that we've reached now, yeah? Uh, and how at the same time the British have a difficulty with coming to grips with who they are, 
the sort of country they live in and their history, because it seems to me this is absolutely tied up with understanding the history of what happened is not something in the past, but is absolutely situated in the current moment. So maybe, Maya, you could say a few words about, I don't want to trivialise it because it's really serious, but the Hagar, Harry and Meghan thing, because what really strikes me about that is precisely what you said about whose voices get heard. Mm. Because as well as all these elderly white men, and you know, not really upset <laughs> anybody here, there have been many women of colour appearing mm. in the media saying, well, actually, yeah. listen to our experience. Yeah. We know yeah. what it's like to live in this country. Listen to what we're saying, and they are, end up being completely ignored. Yeah. So maybe just stop. Yeah, I mean, I think the thing about it is as well, and I d there are hopeful things to talk about too, which <laughs> we'll also cover, um, hopefully. Uh, but it does, when you look at that, you do think you can be like the most privileged of the most privileged of the most privileged, and you're saying there is race that, you know, they've talked about there was a statement issued a while ago by, I think by Harry, saying that there was racist, racial undertones, basically saying the press coverage of Meghan Markle was racist. And so you can get to that point say that and you're still not believed like in this beloved institution of the monarchy people still will not believe it and i've been in taking part in some of these debates and you say you give the evidence you give all the evidence you say these are the, in the instances in which the coverage of Meghan Markle has been racist and you're still met with i don't see it i don't see it and you do think for some of these people when you have these avert these instances of avert racism and one of the articles about her the journalist talked about her as bringing some exotic, exotic DNA to the royal family. It's, 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 ra it's racist, right? This is racism, so clearly. And still people will not accept it. It does make you think and reflect on how poorly equipped actually large sections of our media are to understand racism in Britain and what that means for how it's being perpetuated by much of our media. And thinking about if, you know, if, they, can't, if they can't engage with these overt forms of racism that are being um, called out by people who have the biggest platforms, the most, some, some of the highest status in the country, um, then it makes you feel quite depressed about the chances of talking about structural racism in this slightly more serious way. And this isn't all of the media, it isn't every single debate that happens, but it does tell you a lot about the level of denialism, I think, that goes on. Mm -hmm. And this level of, of, of ignorance, claiming innocence, not knowing, what that means for how whiteness operates in Britain as well, I think is part of, part of this that we never really get to in those debates. We're only ever talking about the racism that people are experiencing, never the whiteness that is at play, that is also there in, in these, the, the production of this racism. Um, yeah, I think that it, it, it's not great, but I do think that there is, you know, the fact that there are people who are resisting these narratives and there are people who have these platforms in this way, they shouldn't have to do that. People shouldn't have, think, shouldn't have to talk about their experiences in this way. But the fact that the, that does exist is at least something. I think it means that there are people resisting some of those narratives. And some of this, so what you find when you talk to some of these people is, that, is they, they're feeling threatened. Hmm. They feel like their power is being threatened. And so it's a reaction to that. And so that tells us that there is important forms of resistance that are going on and they're in some ways being successful. Like even if you look at the equal pay case of the BBC, there are these moments of, there are these moments of hope where actually people are succeeding in contesting and challenging what is the status quo. And some of this is a kind of backlash to that as well, I think. Yeah, and I thought it was great that she mentioned uh, the Grunwick strikers actually yeah. in her speech afterwards. That was a, a, sort of a nice moment. Okay, well maybe we could pick up on that, these sort of forms of resistance, because I wanted to move on to really discuss um, the state of the left at the moment, okay. <laughs> if, we, if we dare go there, um, especially after the election, it's a little bit depressing. But um, because what also strikes me is that in the last 40 years or so, um, the history of the left in this country in anti-racist struggles has been very checkered and highly problematic and uh, a sort of a directional sort of centralised idea of telling people what to do and this idea of going into communities of colour and telling them how to organise rather than listening to them and mm. you know um, so it's been highly problematic patronising there's been a lot of instances of left parties have been very racist uh, and in all the discourses around Brexit we've actually seen some really I think problematic uh, rhetoric coming out about supporting immigration controls you know mm. which you know there's nothing which is not racist about that 
And of course, um, a lot of energy has gone into the Labour Party because of Corbyn and um, we can discuss that, so-called progressive politics and all the rest of it. So I just wanted to get your idea about what you think uh, organising against the structural racism and the oppressive structures of this country, where it's going to actually come from now, and um, what's, what, what's the position of Parliament and parliamentary democracy, and mm. what's the position of organising from without mm. that as well? Um, I think so soon after the election, maybe I'll change my mind. Um, I think right now, I do think there is still a role for like parliamentary politics. It's a necessary vehicle, right? If you want to, in some way, make some changes at the level of the state, you can improve things in a significant way. And one of the things that I thought a lot about um, when trying to write the conclusion was the fact that if you totally ignore that, if you totally say there's no point in engaging with parliamentary politics at all, and I think it's fine for some people to say that, I'm not saying everyone needs to, then I think you do ignore the ways that, for instance, the immigration system, it's always going to be exclusionary, it's what an immigration system is, but it can be vastly improved in the sense that it could make a measure, like a huge difference to a lot of people's lives if you did things, like things that seem quite simple, like reducing fees, making, there was a report out today, um, the, the immigration system is overly compli complicated and I found that with everyone I talked to who tried to navigate the system but also people who worked as immigration lawyers or advisors saying you know even as someone someone said to me even as someone who English is my first language I cannot make sense of all of this legislation it's so confusing it's so unnecessarily confusing um, doing things like that things like um, refugees he talked about un unaccompanied child refugees safe passage. There are things that you could do It's the level of government that I think would make a massive difference to people's lives. And so it is necessary to think about that. And I don't think that we should, un like, I don't think we should ignore the impact that that can have. But there is a but. <laughs> um, as like there inevitably is with this, these kinds of things. I think in terms of the next five years, which is, I guess is, at least in the UK, if we're thinking within this country, um, there is a limit, I think, to the Labour Party or any other political party is a vehicle for trying to organise around this particular issue. And the reason why I say that is because I don't think that means you don't do it for the people who want to, but I think there has to be forces outside of that. And that's always been the case, that push that, but also that try to demand things that, that those governments are maybe never going to deliver on or politicians are never going to deliver on, or at least not anytime soon. And the reason why I say that is because... Um, is because if you look at the nature of the debate, uh, there is like an acceptance in significant number of, uh, by a significant number of politicians about this narrative of, for instance, the white working class. So they talk about the white working class and northern constituencies being lost. Um, and to me, what, it, what, that, what that kind of reads on, as well as being an inaccurate analysis of exactly what has happened and who the working class is, and unnecessarily talking about white... Why is whiteness relevant to understanding the working class? I don't know. Um, but as well as that, it kind of tells me that a political party is always going to be interested with trying to gain political power, right, through the system that we currently have, which is an, not a great system in terms of electing representatives, but is the one we have at the moment. And so they're, all, they're always going to be making concessions on these very issues. And as you mentioned, the history of this... The labour movement broadly doesn't come out of this well. There are people organising against racism and against immigration controls within the labour movement and within the Labour Party, that is true. But for decades and decades and decades, significant proportions of the trade union movement, for instance, have seen the legitimate worker as the white worker. And that has shifted in some ways, but immigration status is still relevant to some of those trade unionists, some of those trade unionists who have an incredible amount of power. And I think spending so much energy trying to challenge them within these structures is is maybe not so, it's not always productive. It's productive at times, but I actually think organising outside is, all, is, is really the way to do some of this. And it also depends on what happens with organisations like the Labour Party. Um, but I do feel like only being focused on trying to get state power, only being focused on being trying to win an election and being government means that your analysis is going to be watered down in ways that I think is probably unhelpful to challenging anti-immigration sentiment and challenging racism in Britain more broadly. I think the two have to come, there has to be the dual, two things running alongside one another. Yeah, no, I, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the trade union movement because absolutely the history of the trade union movement in this country is ridiculously racist. And if you look at the history further back, I mean, it was actually 
English workers who took out very racist traditions to South Africa and Australia, for example. Yeah? And the cultural arguments you use were exactly what we used under apartheid in mm. South Africa. So these similarities just do sort of spread internationally in quite important ways. I mean, maybe we could discuss Parliament. I mean, I think, you know, partly what we're seeing at the moment is a much wider crisis of social democracy mm. as well, so it brings mm. in other questions. Um, but shall we open it up to yeah. some okay. more debate from you now? Right. Yes. Okay. Um, just indicate and I'll call you. So, over here. Um, I'm, can I thank you for the uh, introduction? And it is appalling that this is a population that doesn't have any history of what has happened to itself uh, for the last probably 30 years. I mean, I'm not saying it did before then, but I think one's also got to be aware that there have been things in the past where there's been an attempt to look at issues like immigration and racism within an education system. The thing that is appalling today, and ever since all these different types of schools have developed, like academies and everything else, when you actually had a centralized education system through local authorities, there were policies that were, could be enacted through all schools in an area. And an example is, for example, London. 1981, there were riots. The ILEA, which was the Inner London Education Authority, which controlled all the schools other than the private schools right the way through Inner London, decided something had to happen. Quite clearly, the politicians, which was a left Labour politicians grouping, decided there had to be some way that schools were going to start tackling what was happening on the streets but also in the schools. And every school in London in 1981 was instructed to produce not a multi-education policy, an anti-racist policy. And they employed a group of us, there were about 10 of us, maybe more than that, 12 of us, a group in Lambeth and a group in uh, Tower Hamlets and Hackney, who were going to just help schools do that. And it was a four-year process. And it was trying to get staff in schools, students in schools, at all ages, from primary and secondary, and also parents and community people, to start looking at what, what evidence there was of racism and how you try and control it. And that's one of the things, it was a very short period, but it meant that for a lot of people in schools, for a lot of students came out of schools at that time, having had education about migration, about colonialism, about imperialism. It was a very, very political sort of period. And of course, what happens? And you're absolutely right. It gradually disappears. And of course, then New Labour brings in a completely different form of ways of looking at education. And we have today people who can go through schools knowing nothing at all. Mm. And let's remember that the very first Migration Act, in a sense, was that Aliens Act in 1905, which directed for what? It wasn't about black population, it was against Jews. It was to try and control the Jewish population coming into Britain from the pogroms in uh, Russia and Eastern Europe. And you just think, you know, that was then. Mm. And the seeds of what, in fact, we know, as now everything's deemed to be, and, and I will, you know, I'm not going to hold back on this, the, the appalling statements that are currently being made about what is anti-Semitic, and if you, for example, criticize Israel, you are deemed to therefore be anti-Semitic. But that is something that's built in the last, well, it's over 100 years now. It's after 1904, and clearly it was seeded beforehand, but it's there running the way, the way through. And I just think one of the things we've got to be aware of, all of us have a responsibility in this. We should be saying to people who are running our schools, that they should be doing something completely different from what they are doing at the moment. They've got to be a far, far more political education right the way through schools. Fabulous, thank you. And do we have a hand over here? Another one? Okay. Do we have other hands? Okay, over here. Um, and then you. Yes. Hello, I'm Maria. I'm from Brazil. 
Um, the interesting thing that we have in Brazil regarding immigration is that during the period uh, before Bolsonaro, we changed our immigration laws to be exactly reciprocal. Everything that uh, the other countries do with Brazilians, we, we started to do with them. So if they ask us for a visa, for a process of doing uh, something to get into the country, we did the same thing. So we had exactly reciprocal relations. And it kind of um, amazed the Americans how terrible it was the process to get into Brazil. So uh, it's a different perspective when you are in a colonized country because normally colonized countries just open their arms to immigrations mm. they just do that but um, and I would like to understand um, that big difference that there is in England because as I could understand England had uh, almost no, uh, no legis legislation regarding restrictions to immigration until the, the 19th century. It was open to immigration, quite open to immigration. I mean, uh, Karl Marx that was uh, persecuted all over Europe, he could just come into England and be here. And uh, those are things that uh, I, I'd like to understand. How could this change? How could this happen? How the British became that very um, con conscious about the whiteness? Because mm -hmm. this is something that I cannot understand from a colonized point of view. Because there we were uh, brown and then there was a bunch of white people that invaded our country and decimated us. So our idea of immigration is quite different. Normally the immigration people come to destroy us. Okay, thanks. And over here. Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, thank you for your talk and I think one of the really interesting things you guys have brought up is the kind of asylum system in the UK where it's kind of having been privileged enough to kind of volunteer work with some people in the kind of going through the process is kind of really horrific you know you have things like you said of indefinite detention people can be arrested at any point um, and particularly um, uh, and I think it's really interesting that, like you were saying with cult, the idea of culture, one of the things is the idea of trying to preserve this kind of liberal idea of the UK when actually the things being done almost in the name of preserving are so kind of brutal and kind of authoritarian, even kind of holding people indefinitely who have been committed a crime. Um, and I guess it kind of relates to your point, but almost kind of, this weaponizing of this idea of liberal culture and this cognitive dissonance of how people in such vulnerable situations, even treatment of like queer asylum seekers, definitely is kind of how that can be justified in the mind of like um, an extent a supposedly liberal country. Mm. Mm. Thank you. My name is Bert and Joseph. I'm from South Africa. We, of course, have a different set of immigration challenges altogether. The point I appreciate is which you've made the need for that thrust from civil society in changing attitudes and the need for civil, civic education, which has also been made by the speaker over there. There's been quite a number of changes to 
immigration legislation and policies uh, ever since 1994. I myself work in the immigration regime for a period of 14 years. But no matter the extent and kind of changes that you bring about, you still need a change in the consciousness of people because essentially migrants live in communities mm. where they interact with citizens. Mm. You know, in, it's at that level of interaction that you actually gauge, you know, where the country is going. Mm. So that's just the point I felt that, you know, I appreciate a lot and which I will be taking away uh, from the seminar this evening, you know, civic engagement, civic education, you know, just in terms of changing uh, attitudes, um, it has to be a consistent ongoing process. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to take this one and then we'll... Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah just very quickly. I guess your point and the um, first point also kind of relate to one another. So I think there's, there's a shorter term thing of thinking about how you try to change people's minds and I guess combat some of these myths. And I think that you're right that I talk a lot about like national level politics, um, but actually a lot of these changes do need to happen at more of a community level. And that's one of the things that I also took away from the election is you got to have this be, to be consistent all year round and to be people around you making some of these arguments. I think that's very difficult to achieve because you then need political education in like a, a, a big way. Um, but I think it's necessary. I think that's where some of these changes are going to happen in the shorter term in terms of combating some of these ideas. I know that when I've spoken to people, um, like members of the public, about some of these things, you it's not about... One of the things that I often is often said to me is, oh, you want to just call everyone racist, right? Because you talk about racism in the debate, you just want to say everyone's a racist and that's it. But actually, what you need to do is, as I said before, is you locate where race is and then you try to, I guess, grapple with that, right? So talk to someone about exactly what is it that you dislike about X group of immigrants coming into the country and then really have that discussion. And it doesn't mean, like, if you're doing, I don't know, I guess party political campaigning or any other kind of really this kind of community engagement it doesn't mean like shouting someone telling they're wrong but it does mean really questioning them and what a lot of the debate has done on immigration um is about just really accepting accepting it and thinking you can't change it and that's why i mentioned this kind of in the inevitability argument i just think has been so effective because people think oh it's just not possible it's just not possible to change people's minds on this i think it's really hard I think it's very, very hard. It's been built up over years and decades and decades and decades, hundreds of years of this kind of racial logic. But I think it is possible. It's not inevitable. I don't know, I don't know I'll live to see it, but I think it's possible to change it in a big way. And I think this connects to the education point is, you're right, they, there have been like lots of great initiatives that have happened throughout history that I think we should draw on and not ignore because there's a risk I know that I have a tendency of making everything seem like it's doomed and nothing good has ever happened. But of course, I tried in the book to pinpoint some of these moments, not the exact example you're talking about, but to recognize that and to see what worked, right? Even though it maybe was washed away, what did work, right? Um, because this is, the, this is the longer term battle. If you can get into schools, I often say like, do a reverse Michael Gove, like, do the opposite of what Michael Gove has been trying to do to the history curriculum. I've talked to so many teachers who say, we ch some of them say we try to teach this, it's not part of the national curriculum, even though the curriculum says it, Britain, it, we should learn about Britain and its relationship with other parts of the world. Empire is not there, which is ludicrous. Um, but the teachers that are trying to do it, they try to do it, or there are people who are trying to do it, but they're not sure how, right? And there's an anxiety... I don't want to be essentialist about it, but our teaching force is also pretty white, and so there's an anxiety around talking about race and issues of colonialism in a way that isn't going to be that's going to be right and isn't going to be too contentious. And I think because it's seen as political to talk, teach about empire, we should say as if it's political to not be silent about it. Like this should be the response. This is inherently political to say nothing about it. Um, so I think actually working towards there's a body that helps. Um, uh, teachers teach about the Holocaust, right? That, that exists in the UK. There should be an equivalent thing for Empire and talking about that. And actually, there are efforts by some teachers to be doing this kind of work and linking those people up. 
Um, I think it would be a good way, a good way forward, because I know loads of people have emailed me saying, what, how do I, can you come in and tell us how to teach about this? It's, that's how desperate they are, they're asking me, and I don't, you know, I don't, I don't have all the answers on that. So I think those two things are, are both really necessary, this like longer term thing about changing the education system so that actually young people and all of us in society have the, have the tools to question these things and challenge these things but know about these histories and then the shorter term thing as well about getting into those communities sooner and beginning to have those debates um, and then just very quickly um, the asylum thing I think it's a really good question I think two ways that it happens is politicians justify stricter asylum legislation by talking about pull factors so they say there are certain things that encourage people to come and seek asylum in the UK um, like a generous welfare system. And so that's why they've done things like reduce the amount of money available to people who are waiting on their claims to be processed. So if you're an asylum seeker now in the UK and you're eligible, you only get £37.75 and pence a week um, to live off of, which is abs absurd. And what we know is that actually successive studies have shown that poor factors are not really aren't a thing. They're not an issue. People try to get to countries like the UK to claim asylum for all kinds of reasons. So that myth about pull factors I think needs to be busted because one of the things when search and rescue missions in the Mediterranean were pulled, politicians in the UK and across Europe said the, the search and rescue missions are pull factors. People make that dangerous crossing because they think that there will be boats there to, 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 to rescue them. And what has happened is that people have continued to die in the Mediterranean, right? People, last year, um, I mean, the figures are very hard. They're not like reliable in a lot of ways because it's hard to know, but they think around 2,000 people died trying to make that crossing in the across the Mediterranean. Um, but I would also, if you're interested, there's a book by an academic called Lucy Mablin. It's called Asylum After Empire. And she talks about how the tightening legislation for asylum actually came when the countries of origin changed. So in the, like, before the 90s, she argues, that the figure of the asylum seeker in places like the UK was a white person fleeing communism. And increasingly, it was people from former colonies, black and brown people from former colonies that were coming to the UK to claim asylum. And that's when you get the tightening of legislation. So you have this relationship between what she calls like the colonial logics. So this is colonialism still at play. Um, and I think that that's how Britain became... Like the question about whiteness in Britain, Bridget Anderson, who is at, I think she's still at Oxford, what she does is she documents actually how a lot of the ideas about immigration now and the narratives and these notions of control were also applied domestically within England to poor people. So what she says is a lot of the, the ideas about the movement of poor people in Britain, so you have things like vagrancy acts, like from hundreds of years ago, that tried to curb the, the movement of poor people within England. She says those logics are applied to like globally to immigration. And so you always have some of these ideas about who can move and who is, who is who's considered okay to move, who's considered the threat, and how this links to capital. But really, a lot of the work suggests that it is to do with Britain's, like, Britain's empire beginning to fall apart. And it, it literally was just people were moving. Like more, the fact that more people could move meant that Britons were saying, we want to keep this kind of racial purity that had never been. But you see it when, um, when Empire Windrush comes, immediately a group of Labour MPs organise and write to the Prime Minister and say, we don't want these people coming here, they're a threat to our economy. So the whiteness always existed with empire, it was there, but this belief in superiority and this kind of idea that Britain was the superior country, I think, was upheld by a strong empire. And as that begins to falter, I think you begin to see that change. Okay. Do you want to say something? Yeah, just a very obvious and quick point, though. Um, it's just basically in response to you, because you were saying, how did this happen? You know, it's not till the 19th century that we see Britain introducing these things. Well, it's an international thing. You could say the same. I mean, Myers Wright and Bridget Anderson's work, she does illustrate how uh, restrictions on the movement of the poor uh, have been extended in various ways. And, of course, you mentioned capital. It's all to do with the control of labour. But what mm. we start to see increasingly is that this drive for profit, and especially since the 1970s, when we had a sort of complete structural real realignment of the uh, capitalist system, where that is extended and immigration controls just proliferate, yeah? But what's interesting, I think, is that there's a myth, there's a huge myth going on here because basically, you know, the whole discussion about open borders, our borders are open. Mm -hmm. The only difference is that a lot of people, uh, the elite, uh, cross borders safely and they live in a borderless world 
and there's a large number of people who only cross borders. They just carry on crossing them, but it's hugely expensive and hugely dangerous. Yeah? Mm. And that's the anomaly we have at the mm. moment. And what that's led to, uh, I mean, Maya mentioned the whole sort of rise, how the conditions have been now made right for smugglers. Yeah? But our border regime, which exists internationally, is hugely profitable. You know, governments have outsourced it, most of it to private mm. firms. You mentioned the complexities of immigration law. Well, that has led to a whole industry uh, of people who have now become experts mm -hmm. in these things and the visa fees, etc., etc. So the whole border regime is a profitable mm -hmm. capitalist enterprise, mm -hmm. and it's also the case that people who are supposedly illegal are easier to exploit, so therefore mm -hmm. it's very beneficial to uh, governments across the world to actually have this sort of hidden economy and mm -hmm. hidden labour and stuff like that, coexisting with what they deem to be legal workers and the mm. legal working class yeah mm. so those things always coexist and you know what well, our job is to make that um, not only apparent but you know emphasize the structural change that needs to take place alongside changing people's minds mm. and busting the myths mm. yeah because this is a, a problem of political economy mm. first yeah. and foremost yeah and i think yeah. just to add on to that it's that what's telling is um the under david cameron the conservatives had a net migration target to reduce net migration to the tens of thousands and what um a lot of research shows is that they knew that was never going to be achievable right they had that target but they always knew they needed people from outside of the eu to come in and do particular jobs so what they do is it's not even that they like people can't move some people can't move but they are willing to give out some of these visas that are just on terrible terms. And so what it means is they are saying, on the one hand, we're going to reduce immigration, we're going to control it. But at the same time, they're saying, OK, we're going to give out some visas to some people. Like, it's limited. But knowing full well that they're not going to meet the very targets that they've set themselves because they want an exploitable workforce. And migrant labor is part of that. And so... <laughs> It's, it's, so, it's so clear in what they're doing and who's coming into the country. People are not, you can't, it's so difficult if you're not an EU migrant and will soon be very difficult probably if you're an EU migrant to come into the UK without some kind of visa. They know they're doing that, but it just works for them. It's, the rhetorical side works with this kind of colder, harder side of it, exploitation. Yeah. Was there a hand over there before? No? Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, hi. Uh, I just have a, a question uh, remark uh, because we're going to face in the next few decades uh, unprecedented waves, unprecedented numbers uh, of migrants and of course I'm not saying this in a negative way but because countries are going to face this uh, and if the narrative doesn't change, if there's not a new social contract that's created between populations, like a global social contract that's based on solidarity and on exchanges of whatever can be exchanged for the better of, on the global scale. Um, I don't see how we can actually accommodate these waves, how countries will. There's no possibility if the whole narrative doesn't change, if it's not a popular incentive to, to follow up on this solidarity because, um, what's my question? Yeah, uh, yeah, it's, it's really about the, the practical, my question is about practically uh, deracing immigration because otherwise they, I just, I can't even imagine like what, what places will look like because if people don't accept then the policies won't be implemented and then we'll be in this disastrous mm. situation, right? Mm. Other questions? Yes. Thank you. Thank you both for your speeches. Uh, I would like to link a little bit to that because like, I think part of the problem is to change the narrative in this sense uh, in seeing migration as something to manage in a certain sense. Uh, and this is obviously because um, I mean, uh, the, the, the political world is still structured around nation states and obviously mm -hmm. they, they have their policies and they, and they see immigrants as uh, foreigners uh, and so they want to regulate that. I think part of the solution to that 
would be to uh, focus on the reasons why migration is happening. Because, for example, as uh, I'm not sure who's spoken, <laughs> but um, one of the reasons why um, it is said that migration will uh, will see will experience uh, an increase uh, in migration in the next years uh, is due to climate change, right? Because like uh, part of the world. Uh, are not going to be livable in uh, 20 or less years. Um, so I think that the whole uh, focus uh, should shift in that sense, not in managing migration, because like people will move because they don't have a choice, uh, but to, to look at the causes, and poverty is one, climate change is another one, war uh, is another one. So um, I think the whole narrative it's, it's completely messed up because we're just looking at the, prob the problem in a sense, which is not, uh, because most, of the, most people are just moving because they have to, not mm -hmm. because they want to. Mm -hmm. So we should, um, like, whatever we're doing in our lives, but like the, 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 the focus should be more on the causes of migration, I guess. Um, and yeah, so we, we, I, I think that um, we should focus more on that and obviously mm -hmm. taking care of um, uh, issues of racism within uh, specific contexts, but yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so just at the back. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I just wanted to talk, yeah, just kind of to build on the um, kind of an irony within the climate point almost is that if the kind of white populations of the world, the first time that an existential threat has actually been perceived as climate, if, if that would be the moment of the, of the deracialization of migration, I think there would be a definite irony there in that, um, you know, the, the extinction of populations has always been a threat for, or, you know, in, in the history of terms of what you've been talking about, it's been a threat for, um, for communities of color, but as soon as perhaps that existential threat is extended through climate breakdown, if, if that's the moment that nation states starts to dissipate and racialization starts to go out of the migration debate, I think there'll be a, uh, quite a sad irony there for, 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 you know, for, for, for everything we've been talking about today. Okay. Yeah. I just wondered um, how, whether there were any links potentially to be drawn um, between sort of the racist crackdowns and like the rhetoric around um, sort of anti-gypsy rhetoric in the elections that we've seen with conservatives, you know, pledging um, about sort of Roma populations and how that's, yeah, how that's characterized in the media and by political parties and how it's used as a sort of vote winner um, mm. in the same way that you were talking about how immigration policies can be used. Mm. Thanks. Okay. Are there any last questions? Yes. I guess my question has to do with whether class or race is more important. Because I think like if you have a, a black person who is a multimillionaire, the borders are open for him to travel around the world. The same for a Muslim or, you know. So when you are thinking about this in a, in a, in a, in a globalized world, um, what, where is the real border? Um, is it in race or is it in, 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 in class and, and, and money and what it comes with it mm. in this society? Thank you. Do you want to say a few words I, and then I we love bring the in golden oldies, yes, is it plaster, is it race? Yeah, I'll leave that to Maya. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just wanted to make um, my short concluding uh, uh, thoughts actually on a positive note because we said we'd do that. And it does strike me there's another historical continuity here. Um, I mentioned earlier on that Sarah Ahmed, when she came out of court, mentioned the Granwick strikers. So, of course, there is a long history in this country of. Um, migrant workers, workers of colour, multiracial working class coming together to fight uh, injustice. 
And it really strikes me at the current moment that that's, we see the most progressive things that are going on, precisely how Grunwick, um, that tradition of Grunwick has been carried on to the uh, migrant workers who are in unions, forming unions at the moment mm. precisely because the labor movement in this country is so wanting mm. and fighting their own struggles. Uh, Uber drivers, Deliveroo, cleaners, porters, all of that are just doing amazingly well at the moment and how they're sort of trying to be beaten back. I don't know if you saw, but James Farah, who is involved with um, Uber drivers, is just in court at the moment because the police arrested him because he was shouting too loudly on his megaphone and they complained that they had damaged one of the policemen's ears, despite the fact she recovered three minutes later. But, you know, uh, that's very interesting. So I, I think that's something that really that we should appreciate and, and value, um, including our own cleaners at SOAS. Of course, it's a very positive thing. So let's finish with that. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I really agree. In that, in that, I think that's also... Before, actually, so I don't forget to say, like one of the things as well you, meant, you asked before about where to organise. My, I think that if you want to spend time organising in political parties, that's great as well. But if you have time, if you have like the energy, if you have money, then I would say a lot of immigration support and advice services. I went to quite a few around the country. Um, are always under-resourced, understaffed, there is huge levels of burnout, and so this, I'm trying to be positive, uh, so, 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 they, you know, there's problems, but they do amazing work, like, some of these spaces are spaces where they say, you know, this is not about charity, this is about solidarity, this isn't, doesn't matter what your immigration status is, we're going to support you, and so if you have time, if you have money, give that to those places, because over the next five years, it will be bleak. Things are not going to get like ma amazingly better for a lot of people um, who things are already quite bad for. So there is a possibility to make a change and to use your energies to do that. And that those spaces can be spaces for major transformation as well. So I think that's 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 something to be heartened by and to to remember. Um, and so I'll just really quickly the questions these questions about climate um, and. I guess, uh, yeah, reasons why people move. Yeah, I mean, I agree with you. I think it's a major challenge, but I think that it's very necessary to begin to um, tackle some of these racial logics that are at the heart of a lot of the debate. But one thing that is, I guess, practically being done by um, certain activists, and Asad Raymond, who I mentioned before, who's the director of War on Want, I believe is involved in, because he's the person that mentioned it to me when I was doing the research for the book, is there are people who are organizing to around um, the implementation of a term that is climate refugees. So because people who are fleeing climate, climate change, climate breakdown, or have been forced to move because of it, are not covered by the 1951 Refugee Convention, there is organizing around that. And although the 1951 Convention is problematic in a lot of ways, another piece of legislation like that would be, another um, convention like that would be probably problematic in certain ways. It would, if implemented, or at least taken up by some countries, provide very concrete protections to people that I think are important. And so maybe check check out the kind of work that's being done around that as well. Um, because I think as well as this longer term thing of trying to change the debate, there does have to be some short term measures to try and offer protections to people. And um, the thing that I guess you're talking about is uh, push factors. So I mentioned pull factors before that politicians are obsessed with. It's push factors that are the things that actually matter. And so I think we can try to flip the narrative on its head whenever it's mentioned. Um, yeah, and the, I always think of Paul Gilroy when I think about this question about race. And he says, if you know, your anti-racist organizing should be trying to imagine a world in which, in which race makes no sense. And I think that is a very um, helpful way of understanding what that organizing might look like. Um, and OK. the. Question of Ro Roma, um, yeah, I think it is. I think the forms of racialization that are going on can be slightly different, but what you find in the new labor years, 1998, uh, they do this exact thing. So there are, there are Roma refugees arriving in the UK, and there is like a really just absolute bile on the fronts of so many of the British newspapers, and the new labor government just don't fight, really fight it. They reproduce a lot of the narratives. So a lot of those narratives about immigration you do find are just so similar about the Roma. And so I think connecting up those struggles as well in a very clear way is maybe a helpful way of, of trying to tackle that. Um, and I guess I'll end on class or race. Um, both. <laughs> uh, you know, um, 
these things are not separate. They're in operation together. And yeah, it's true there's a global elite that is multiracial, as well as there's a working class that's multiracial. But immigration controls are classed and they're raced. And so even if you are have a ton of money, you may still be subject to racial profiling when you go through airports, and you may still be subjected to immigration rules in a particular way. And I actually think, although it's true that like the super elite can move around with relative ease, and we should talk about that, we should talk about the open borders that exist for those people, for loads of people, and not everyone, it depends on what your passport is, for loads of people, actually, immigration controls, the cost in the UK and the, how difficult they are, they aren't really good for many people at all. One of my friends, who now has them definitely to remain, was tied to her employer. Um, like they were sponsoring her, and that was not good for her in lots of ways. So she, in some ways, she was relatively privileged, but in another way, she was... have You know, you, it's very difficult to move employer and find someone else who's going to sponsor you. And so... I don't think we should be talking about it as like an either or all. <laughs> Class and race exist in the same, <laughs> for a lot of people, um, you know, they're relevant for both, they're, in, they're both relevant. Um, and so I think that debate's been had for so long, especially on the left, and I just think it's time to recognize, as has been said, the working class in Britain and globally is multiracial. <laughs> and that's where I'll end on. <laughs> okay, join me in thanking Maya. So everyone is warmly welcome to join the reception uh, upstairs in the SCR in this building. It's on the first floor. And also uh, to join us next week, same time, same place, 21st of January, for a panel um, with Gilbert Archkar, Janan Al-Jabiri, and Rima Majed on the second Arab Spring Seasons of Revolution. <laughs>